gentlemen, thank you all who have come to attend this important session on a very, very important subject which is not only closer to our hearts but is also haunting us all over in the world because the threat which we are, fa which we are faced with now can hit us anywhere at any time around the globe. Hence, the need to sit together and look at the challenges and formulate a collective response. Ladies and gentlemen, I am here to talk about the security challenges faced by Pakistan. Well, security as briefly explained by Jan Zahir is a very, very wider subject. With our growing awareness, it is becoming even more important. It is no more a domain of integrity, sovereignty and borders of a country. Ever since people have been made the stakeholders of the security. It is said that if people of a country are not secure, how the country can be secure? So ladies and gentlemen, the dimensions and the sphere of security begins from the upper space. It comes down to global commons, cyberspace, cyber data, global power politics trends, regional power politics trends, and then it homes on to largely around the people, for the people. The security is in larger sphere of energy, water, food, and it also goes down <coughs> subsurface that the resources that you have been blessed with, are you using them, misusing them, or abusing them? So it is vertical and horizontal. In my talk, I am not referring to the internal challenges that we are faced with because that would lengthen my presentation and also that the internal challenges <coughs> that we are faced with, a lot of them are manageable and reversible and inshallah we will manage them well in coming times by way of belonging to the progression. I however want to dwell about the security challenges that we are faced with in our region. Ladies and gentlemen, our hard time started ever since the USSR invasion of Afghanistan, though we have fought more than two wars with India, 9-11 and the resultant extremism and terrorism. Our challenges are also there in instable Afghanistan, ambitious India, and the rebalancing policy of Asia. And we, are, we are also faced with the challenges in the strategic stability of the region. I want to dwell on them. And as a reference, I do want to talk to, or I want to begin with, from the USSR invasion of Afghanistan, subsequently 9-11, and what we are faced with is instable Afghanistan. Ladies and gentlemen, USSR invaded Afghanistan. Here's a question. 
was this of our doing? Did Pakistan have to do anything with it? Did we instigate this? No. Pakistan instead became a frontline state of the US and the West. Pakistan fought along with Afghanistan and saved the sovereignty of Afghanistan. Another question. If Pakistan did not stand with Afghanistan, could there have been any Afghanistan on the map of the world today? Today, Afghanistan owes her sovereignty to Pakistan and to its people. If Pakistan, instead of fighting along with Afghanistan, US and West had offered a trade corridor to USSR, could US have been the only superpower? Or the world could still be bipolar? U.S. owes its unipolar superpower status to Pakistan. And, ladies and gentlemen, if USSR had not been dismembered, could the Berlin Wall fall? Germany owes her unification to Pakistan. And if USSR was not dismembered, how come the 14 states would gain the independence? These are our linkages with the history. And after USSR dismemberment, US and West abandoned Afghanistan, which created a huge vacuum filled by anarchy, chaos, brutal intra-tribal wars, to grab the power. Was that of Pakistan's making? Al-Qaeda and jihadi elements flown in once by US entrenched themselves in Afghanistan. Was that Pakistan's fault? Unison of Taliban and Al-Qaeda resulted in the rise of monster of terrorism from Afghanistan, challenging and jolting the world peace. Who had left Afghanistan in a vacuum and chaos from where rose the monster of terrorism who inflicted 9-11? Was that of Pakistan's view? And when 9-11 happened. Was that of Pakistan win? A big no. Did Pakistan stand with those who inflicted 9-11 or with the world? We stood with the world. Afghanistan was massively bombed and Taliban regime was dismantled whole of Afghanistan was injured. And when it came to the political dispensation in Afghanistan, I would like to say that if Taliban were made part of the first elections, could they have been counting votes or fighting today? That was a lost opportunity. Was that Pakistan's fault? No. Taliban motivated the injured society to get Afghanistan liberated from occupation forces. And Taliban are even flourishing today. In the meanwhile, Afghan Taliban's associates of jihad, naming themselves as Tehrike Taliban Pakistan, declared jihad against Pakistan for siding with infidels against Afghan Taliban. 
So ladies and gentlemen, what did we get as a result of becoming a frontline state after 9-11? We were attacked everywhere. So ladies and gentlemen, let me be very clear. Reasons for terrorism in Pakistan are not of Pakistan's making. Terrorism in Pakistan is a result of siding with US, West and her allies, which the world thanklessly forget. We have given 60,000 lives and we have lost enormously, economically. But ladies and gentlemen, it doesn't end here. We are blamed. Pakistan is playing a double game. Pakistan is supporting and providing safe havens to Taliban and Haqqanis. Despite all that we have done, we are even today under a blame. US is blaming Pakistan for siding with Taliban and Haqqanis. And interestingly, Tehrike Taliban Pakistan is fighting with Pakistan for siding with infidels. Ladies and gentlemen, if Pakistan is supporting Taliban and Akhanis, that means Pakistan is not only not siding with infidels, but supporting Muslims. This also means that Pakistan, Taliban, Haqqani are one side. The question is why after all Tehrike Taliban Pakistan is then fighting Pakistan? Can anyone answer? And if Pakistan and Taliban and Haqqanis were one side, why Pakistan could not use them to influence TTP to stop fighting? Why have we lost 60,000 people? And in the current year, we, we have been attacked 130 times, out of which 127 attacks came from across the border from Afghanistan. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, my dispassionate logic and reasoning is that unfortunately, let me say, unfortunately, U.S. has not been able to win the war in Afghanistan. Hence, the blame game. Allow me to say that Pakistan is a morally correct country and on the right side of the history. Ever since USSR invasion of Afghanistan to the events leading to 9-11. How did we take this challenge? How did Pakistan fought back? Just see the enormity of the challenges that we have had. We were assailed in the north and we were also assailed from Balochistan and Karachi. What was it? God forbid we were to make this a landlocked country which we refused to be. The Galant forces fought back, whole nation fought back and we refused to be this. Our operations in FATA, ladies and gentlemen, this is FATA having seven agencies and this is how turbulent it was. 
There were areas which were controlled by terrorists. We had contested control. We had very difficult times. And one of the commanders of 11 Corps is sitting here, under whom I served. The challenges that we were faced with. And how did we go about? We have been launching the major operations, operations like Zarbe Az, and we have been fighting to seek the control of Fatah. And as of today, we are everywhere and Fatah is well under control. Our enemy has transited across the border where he is housed and looked after well. Karachi, our economic hub, with all the potential, also had issues. But we overcame that and today Karachi is normal. Our third challenge has been Blochistan. Ladies and gentlemen, Blochistan is 44% of Pakistan. We are faced with fifth insurgency here. Pakistani flag had been burnt. And with all the humility at my disposal, I was appointed as Commander Southern Command in 2013. And this is the strategy that we evolved. We worked on the root cause mainly, and the basic root cause was negative subnationalism. People did not want to stay with us. What we gave them was the nationalism. And we were also into selected use of force. And this nationalism had to be so much prosperous that it had to, in turn, stop all those who were fighting us. So as military commander, this is the strategy <coughs> that I made for Blochistan. This is a military man telling you. This was power of love, which redeemed. This was of psychotherapy. And when we interfaced with the civil government, so the wholesome strategy was Jiwe Jiwe Blochistan, Jiwe Jiwe Pakistan. Today, people are surrendering their weapons. In the place where the weapon, where the flag was burnt, now there are people who can make the biggest flag and they can go around showing and displaying that map. Terrorism with the efforts of everyone, starting from the government, the armed forces, the people, law enforcement agencies, even our children, has come down. And ladies and gentlemen, Pakistan has already won this. We have defeated this nefarious design. But now we are continuing to pursue our objective. Let me say a few words about ambitious India. For the want of better term, I thought this is ambitious, being ambitious is still positive. Ladies and gentlemen, what is it that India could not get from within the region by way of cooperation? India 
Riding the power tide of U.S. is importing war and perpetual instability in the region. India is virtually bringing an elephant in the region. To mitigate the challenges, China and Russia, and to ensure self-survival, U.S. is exporting war and perpetual instability to South Asia. The region is virtually altered and in critical imbalance, most fragile strategic stability and stability architecture. Ladies and gentlemen, following the military thought, India continues to carve the space for limited war, continues to pose a threat of conventional war despite the nuclear war, despite our nuclear capability and War cannot be ruled out in the region, keeping Pakistan under a constant threat of war. We are facing perpetual undeclared political, military, economic coercion, and we are finding it hard to take off. India has turned out to be the largest arms importer. Indian language, U.S. is opposing our nuclear, U.S. is opposing our CPAC, and in Afghanistan, India is a preferred Another challenge is policy of rebalancing Asia, which is basically containment of China and prevention of resurgence of Russia. Ladies and gentlemen, allow me to show you an open source map. This is how US forces are disposed of on ground. The larger bases, the smaller bases, and maybe this, because of so much of light, this slide is not clearly visible, but largely the forces are disposed of in Eastern Europe to checkmate Russia from there and then in the Pacific region in the South China Sea and somewhere in the middle is Afghanistan and the Muslim world. Maybe this slide is slightly more clear. Containment of China and prevention of resurgence of Russia. Hence the competitive moves. On a better map, if you can see Eastern Europe, <coughs> Afghanistan, India as a counterweight to China, Japan, South Korea, Pacific region, this is basically the design and it looks at keeping China and Russia in their backyard enclaves so that they are never able so that they are never able to challenge. Hence the response one belt one road. Another challenge is strategic stability of the region. Ladies and gentlemen, in fact, our region has already been altered. 
we are living in an altered region. How? India is chosen to challenge China, Afghanistan is chosen to checkmate Russia, India political preference, economic preference, military preference. India land of opportunities, conversely Pakistan a land of threat. India is a growing military power, huge conventional symmetry between India and Pakistan. Look at the defense budgets and the difference therein. Pakistan today is over relying on nuclear to bridge this conventional asymmetry. So we are faced with the challenge of strategic stability and instability paradox. The security architecture of South Asia is under stress. Here is a two front situation becoming for Pakistan. Here is a two front situation coming for India. And there are maximum disputes in the area. And the extremism is also on the rise. So ladies and gentlemen, this region we have to make particular and special efforts to keep its balance because we are only a mistake away. There is a turmoil in the Muslim world that is also a challenge. Allow me to very briefly highlight what happened with Pakistan. We are a nuclear country but we have been made vulnerable from inside. What is happening to Afghanistan? The children have not seen the peace ever since last 40 years. They have seen nothing but war. Are the children of lesser God? War in Iraq in search of weapons of mass destruction? topsy wing the demographic realities? Making bringing Shiites into power, creating a resentment from within, banning Iraqi army, hence the rise of Daesh. What happened to Muslims in all the wars that have been fought? What is happening now? What is the method to madness? Make them to fight among themselves so they don't fight you. In all this, what is the real challenge for Pakistan? What is the place of Pakistan? Ladies and gentlemen, we are going against the grand design. The world looks at us that we are a state in defense because we are failing that grand design. A lot which is happening to us is because of this. And then how to deal with Pakistan? And you know it. Just six F-16 blocked, opposing low-yield nuclear weapons, opposing long-range weapons, Pakistan made irrelevant in Afghanistan, scapegoating, lumping all the blame, asking for Shaquille Afridi, asking for listing of individuals, speaking Indian language on every subject, strangulating through FATF, planning to downgrade all ties, US lawmakers are asking to designate Pakistan as a state sponsoring terrorism. Our 11 entities have been listed. And very recently Pakistan has been singled out, Pakistan has been blamed, Pakistan has been threatened. Our nuclear capability has been linked with the terrorism. India has become the preferred ally in Afghanistan and the military solution is again given the preference. Ladies and gentlemen, these were our challenges. And briefly, coming to the way forward, we have a tough way ahead. 
but let's tackle the immediate challenges first. We actually have to re-alter the region. This is a huge challenge. How do we do that? We fail this and we keep our integrity, sovereignty intact. We refuse to be this. And we prevent all such situations which can jeopardize our strategic capabilities. Our first preference has to be that we should help in reconciliation and stabilization of Afghanistan. This should be our priority. And let me give you a new idea about Afghanistan. To end the suffering of Afghanistan and its people, let's all seek the closure of the conflict instead of winning it. Because we are not going anywhere with the existing strategy. Let's reorientate the entire conflict from military to political. Because this suits the war very well. In this, people of Afghanistan will also be the stakeholders. And those who wish to continue the war will be exposed. Closure is easier than winning. And closure is more enduring. In fact, I feel that U.S. should appoint a political authority in Afghanistan as empowered as the military commander with a view to seek political solution. Make it too prong because military, being a military man, I feel in a situation like this is one-legged. Support it politically. Support the military with the political processes. Create a space for the military and then that is how we could win in Afghanistan. About a way forward on India, ladies and gentlemen, should India and Pakistan, two nuclear states, remain enemy forever is a greater question. If we can address this, and if they realize that they cannot be, they shouldn't be, then they need to engage each other and resolve their disputes. And by resolving their disputes, both the countries need to belong to the future. <coughs> As NSA Pakistan, I am not here to manifest some hard-hitting language. I'm using the language of realization. And I'm thinking on behalf of both the countries. And then the larger question is, should the present generation do this or leave it to the coming generations? And in the end, I would say that the best equation for these two nuclear countries is if we cannot be friends, let's not be enemies. <coughs> On the way forward, ladies and gentlemen, we have everything. We have, we have everything. And we in Pakistan <coughs> think that this is a common future that we hold. Look at this map and look at it how the world is disposed of. 60% of population resides, lives in Asia. Europe only 9.8%, Africa 16.5%, US 
4.8 Australia 0.5 Where is the world? Ladies and gentlemen, where is the world? The world is here in Asia with its north frozen Pacific too much on the flank where is the world? We have all the human resource, consumer markets, manufacturing, natural resources, development scope, connectivity potential. If that is the world, where is the new economic world? That is in Asia. But with north frozen, semi frozen, Pacific too much on the flank, which can be impaired, which can be stalled. Who is and which is the, that country which actually multiplies the potential of this new economic reality and this new economic region which houses great countries like Central Asian Republics, Russia, China, and even India I have included in this. And then look at what Pakistan holds. Through Pakistan, where we cannot go, Pakistan multiplies this entire region. And I would like to say that if India can resolve her disputes with us and look at us by way of friends, we can take India to China, we can take India to Russia, to Europe, and we can make India part of CPAC, whereby the northern India can be looked after by us. Why should they unload everything at Mumbai and traverse all the distances? But it has to be by way of resolution of disputes. But we have a great future. Our future, a massive trade corridor, ladies and gentlemen. And that will re-alter the region. If we become a massive trade corridor, obviously, trade corridor would automatically become a trade hub. If we can become a trade hub, so obviously we will become an economic hub. We will become Asia's industrial hub. Why should production take place in Western China, in Russia, in Central Asian Republics? Why can't everyone be here in Balochistan? co-produce, co-develop and send everything to the world from here. Referring to Blochistan, where I have been Commander Southern Command, just this province can come up with eight <coughs> common border markets with Afghanistan and Iran. Blochistan has the maximum fisheries. Lochistan can have maximum livestock. Lochistan can have maximum fruits. Pakistan can have four more new international cities on the coast. And we have trillion dollars riches. We are a blessed country. And if Afghanistan is not settled still, we are already working on this option. So ladies and gentlemen, challenges aside, Pakistan as a strategic partner of China, Central Asian Republics and Russia has the capacity, the potential to become a gateway. Adopting a cooperative 
model economically viable and progressive nuclear Pakistan with influence in the Indian Ocean will be a power to reckon with. With a strategic partnership of the regional countries, Pakistan itself is a nuclear country. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a great future. Today, somehow, because of a lot of misperceptions, we are undermined, we are misunderstood. And in the earlier part of the presentation, I tried to clarify some of the misperceptions. The world will come to us to mend our relations. 